Good afternoon, everyone. Hope you can all find seats. There's some up front. Don't be shy. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Susan Gibbons. I'm Vice Provost and the Neely Dean of the River Campus Libraries, and it's my pleasure to host and welcome you to our first of the Neely Lecture Series today. Um, the Neely Lecture Series is um, in its, I think it's sixth or seventh year, ninth year, sorry, ninth year. This wonderful series is brought to us through the generosity of Andrew and Janet Dayton Neely Dean. Dayton Neely. Um, and gosh, I'm just so used to saying that. Um, and the endowment was established in part to support library programs that help strengthen the intellectual life of the university as well as the community of Rochester. So it's wonderful to see so many people from the community joining us today, bringing together students and faculty as well as today the University of Rochester Press. So this is the first of the six um, lectures for the year. On your seat should be a bookmark that shows you what else is coming up. We have um, many great speakers coming, including poets, uh, literary cr critics, distinguished authors, inspiring leaders, many of whom are university alums. So it's nice to be able to pull all of that together into one series. Um, tonight is a very special Neely Lecture Series because we've joined forces with the University of Rochester Press in order to put together a program that would help us celebrate the 20 years that the University of Rochester Press has been publishing. And so, uh, therefore, it's only really fitting that we ask uh, Suzanne Guillaume, who is the uh, editorial director of the University of Rochester Press, to have the honor of introducing tonight's speaker. Suzanne is a graduate of the Scholarly Publishing Program at Arizona University State and has been the editorial director of the press since 2004. And with that, I'll turn it over to Suzanne. Thank you, Susan, and thank you all for coming this afternoon. I was pleased when Sandy Thatcher accepted our invitation to speak in the Neely Lecture Series on the occasion of the University of Rochester Press's 20th anniversary, an invitation that uh, aligned itself coincidentally with Sandy's retirement in June after 20 years as the director of the Penn State University Press. Uh, during his time with the Penn State Press, he sponsored more than 500 books for publication in the humanities and social sciences. Notably, during his tenure, he also forged a strong working relationship between the press and the Penn State libraries, resulting in the establishment of the Office of Digital Scholarly Publishing and the administrative merger of the press into the libraries in 2005. Prior to joining the Penn State Press, Sandy spent 22 years at Princeton University Press, where he acquired more than 800 titles and was appointed editor-in-chief in 1985. During the course of his long career as a university press editor and director, he became an expert along the way in copyright law, serving as a member on the copyright committees of the Association of American University Presses, chairing that committee for 21 years, and the Association of American Publishers. He also served as a member of the Association for Copyright Enforcement from 1986 to 1995, overseeing the landmark suit against Texaco and he also serves as a member of the Board of Directors of the Copyright Clearance Center. In February of 2007, the Association of American University Presses released its statement on open access, which he had drafted. So it is our pleasure then to welcome him today to the university to speak on this much debated and often misunderstood subject of increasing relevance to academic life and to scholarly production. Sandy. Thank you, Suzanne and Susan. I'm very pleased to be here to kick off this uh, series this year. Um, I actually have a great fondness for John Wiley and Sons, so being able to speak under the auspices of an Andrew Neely lecture series is, is especially um, pleasing to me. I, uh, in, in my early years in, involved in copyright in the Association of American Publishers Copyright Committee, and also in the Copyright Clearance Center Board of Directors, uh, they had meetings at John Wiley and Sons. Brad Wiley was, and, and then later Deborah Wiley were very much involved in, in copyright issues in those days. Um, and so, you know, Wiley was uh, a major force behind the establishment of the Copyright Clearance Center 
and, and many of the copyright issues over the years. Um, I, uh, I believe I met Andrew on a number of occasions uh, during, during those early years. I, I uh, knew the Wiley operation best when, when Charles Ellis um, was the uh, CEO from beginning in 1990 because Charles also served on the uh, Board of Trustees of Princeton University Press where I was working at the time. Um, I'm also very pleased to, to help celebrate the University of Rochester Press's uh, 20th anniversary. These days, uh, just to say that a press has survived that long in these hard times is, is, is something to uh, cheer about because uh, as some of you I'm sure have, have seen, there are other presses that have been on, uh, potentially on the chopping block, including uh, LSU and, and uh, just recently, just the other day, to great sigh of relief for the rest of us, uh, Northwestern University's administration decided to come out, you know, in strong support of, of its press after having undergone a thorough review um, before starting a search for a new director. So there is still life in the business, although after I read my uh, paper, you may have some doubts about <laughs> how long that, that life will be around. Uh, so without further ado, let me, let me start. I'm going to start by talking a little bit about open access, and then for a long stretch of this, the word won't appear very much, but I will wrap it up, connecting it up about what's going on in, in the world of scholarly publishing with open access. Um, as a term of art, open access, which I will refer to as OA at some points during this talk, has been widely used for not even a decade yet, probably gaining its popularity after a series of declarations identified with the cities of Budapest, Bethesda, and Berlin that made it a familiar phrase to many early uh, in this new century. Came into being in roughly the same period that the uh, word open source uh, became popular. It's sometimes, unfortunately, been confused. Uh, the two have been confused. But they share, do share a common inspiration of, of a democratic ideal of open and free communication and the sharing of knowledge. As any librarian in this audience can tell you, the, the original and still sustaining impotence behind the open access movement was a challenge for academic libraries that the cost of journal subscriptions posed to their budgets as serial prices increased at a rate greater than inflation, sometimes a lot greater. There are many reasons for this, and the, presence, uh, the pressure on commercial publishers to keep profit margins high is only one of the reasons, though perhaps the most prominent in the rhetoric of OA advocates. Other reasons include the growing productivity of scientists as research funding increased dramatically after the end of World War II and the careers of scientists, especially in universities, came to depend on the number of publications even more than their quality. This growth led not only to the proliferation of journals, but also to an increase in the number of issues published and in the length of each issue as it had to accommodate more articles per issue. On top of these exigencies of sheer growth, came the temptations of new technology as a transition from print to electronic added substantial extra costs for publishers to provide all kinds of services beyond just the delivery of content online. Many journal publishers, including even small ones like our press at Penn State, you now use very sophisticated editorial management software systems that offer a wonderful resource for both the academic editors and the publisher staff though it needs to be said that many scholars who edit journals are not eager to learn how to use these systems properly and have to be coaxed, if not even sometimes threatened to go through the training. There are open source alternatives like the open journal system of the public knowledge project that are available for use, but in my experience, they are not at the level of sophistication that the commercially developed products are and may never be. Um, I should add though, and I will mention a little bit later on that there is the Public Knowledge Project also is experimenting with an, what they call an open monograph press, which is not really a press, it's just a name for a software system. And I think that has uh, really terrific potential, although it hasn't been fully developed yet. At any rate, whatever one may think about corporate greed, it is not the only factor that explains the spiraling cost of serials acquisitions for libraries. Where I began my publishing career, Princeton University Press, this was a problem only indirectly since Princeton did not consider itself a major publisher of journals, having only four journals in its portfolio at that time. But the evidence of the impact of the so-called serials crisis on the bread and butter monograph publishing that was at the core of the press's mission became clear. 
I trace my own awakening to the crisis and its baleful effects on scholarly book publishing to internal discussions at Princeton that led to the publication of a series of articles in the early 1970s in the journal then called Scholarly Publishing, which is now known as the Journal of Scholarly Publishing, over a two-year period between April 1972 and April 1974. The titles of these articles were, in succession, The Impending Crisis in University Publishing, The Crisis One Year Later, and The Crisis Is It Over? Not long thereafter appeared an NSF-funded study that brought this crisis to the attention of librarians in a most dramatic way. In their report published in 1975, librarians Bernard Fry and Herbert White found for the period 1969-1973 that the ratio of book to journal expenditures in the largest academic libraries had dropped over that five-year period from better than two to one to 1.16 to one with every expectation that this trend would only get worse, as indeed it did. And in fact, the latest ARL statistics uh, show that the ratio now is in favor of um, expenditures on journals in the ratio of three to one to book expenditures. So it, it's dr rather dramatically reversed um, in the other direction. And in terms of the um, expenditures on books uh, over the period between 1986 and 2004, expenditures on annual expenditures on books in libraries increased by one percent where um, they increased uh, uh, for journal subscriptions uh, uh, many many times that i think it was somewhere around the level 78 80 percent something like that um, fries and white's prognosis for university presses was particularly gloomy their situation they said can be described without exaggeration as disastrous Already heavily encumbered by operating deficits, university presses appear to be sliding even more rapidly toward financial imbalance, they said. Well, how in light of the, this prediction of impending disaster could Bill Becker, the CFO at Princeton University Press and author of that final article in the series, consider the crisis possibly to be passed? His explanation was that, quote, except for the smaller ones, presses for the most part have managed to survive their financial difficulties quite well by making a host of adjustments, including radically increased book prices, substantially lower discounts, economies achieved in book production costs, slashing staffs, publishing more books with sales potential and fewer which cannot pay their own way, special inventory sales, and so forth." End quote. Still, Becker went on to wonder how much more could such methods be used without becoming at some point self-defeating. Ominously, and as we can now see with the wisdom of hindsight, presciently, he ended by pointing to, quote, the increasing danger the presses will turn more and more to publishing books on the basis of saleability rather than scholarly merit, end quote. And while noting the temporary mitigating effects that a generous grant from the Mellon Foundation to presses for publishing books in the humanities might have, he asked, but what then? Indeed, one might ask that last question also in the wake of further grants that the Mellon Foundation has generously provided to fund other book publishing projects including through the American Historical Association and the American Council of Learned Societies, the Gutenberg E and Humanities ebook projects, and even more recently, cooperative ventures among groups of presses or between presses and units on their own campuses to publish monographs in fields where, to borrow the language made famous through the Gutenberg E project, books are, uh, books are endangered species. Uh, that term, by the way, I think was coined by my uh, former boss at Princeton, Herbert Bailey, and then picked up and used very effectively later by Robert Darnton, who was the inspiration behind both the Gutenberg and Humanities ebook projects. <clears throat> As I wrote in a postmortem for Gutenberg E, or Why Ross Atkinson's Dream is Still a Dream, Ross Atkinson being a Cornell librarian who really came up with the idea that Darnton popularized. <clears throat> Um, none of us who served on the advisory board for these ebook initiatives before they were proposed to Mellon for funding believed that they could be self-sustaining beyond the point at which the original funding had been exhausted. And that group included, among others, um, uh, Ann Okerson of uh, Yale's library, who is the person behind the uh, live license listserv, which is such a great place to talk about all these issues. Even though the Humanities ebook project claims to be paying its own way now, it is doing so only because of the addition to the core new monographs of a large corpus of scanned older titles which make the overall package attractive enough to librarians to justify its purchase. 
in a most uh, mostly quite positive review of the Humanities eBook Project in this month's issue of the British Online Reviews in History, Winthrop University Library Dean Mark Herring raises this question of sustainability over the long term, even while recognizing that HEB is currently self-supporting. This is a problem, he says, that, quote, must be worked out. Whether it will or not remains a mystery, and that mystery may well prove to be the undoing of many digital sources, not to mention the whole eBook enterprise, end quote. He goes on to remind us that there is a second major problem that has mostly just been swept under the rug for the time being, digital preservation. People don't want to talk about it these days because, he, he says, it is regarded as unglamorous. Yet, quote, we have not solved the problem, and still it does not look like we will, at least in the short term. When I raised this matter at a cyber conference, it was not greeted with much more than ho-hum, not so polite throat clearing, and a general next question, Finally, a technician stood up and said he wanted to allay my fears. Uh, we'll fix all that, he said. Consider it done. That was 10 years ago. What has happened, though, is that another development in technology that has occurred mostly out of public view and that has effectively bought some more time for university presses before they have to meet the grim reaper. Just in the same way that the changes university presses initiated in the early 1970s kept the sinking ship afloat for another three decades, Digital printing came to the rescue in the late 1990s, just as presses were beginning to despair of keeping their heads above water for much longer. What Cambridge sociologist and publishing entrepreneur John Thompson identified as the hidden revolution in his state of the business study titled Books in the Digital Age <clears throat> turned out to be much more important to the finances of university presses than any revenue streams from e-book sales, which still are minuscule, by the way, in the one to two percent range for most presses, if even that much. You are all familiar with digital printing in its most basic form as the photocopy machine, which has been around for decades now and was, in fact, the single most important controversial element in determining how the Copyright Act of 1976 came to be written. Ever evolving in the more sophisticated forms, this technology became revolutionary for the industry when it was integrated into the book distribution chain in the late 1990s when the major book wholesaler, Ingram, started up a new business under the imprint of Lightning Print, later changed to Lightning Source. That's the name you see up there. The genius of this linkage was to solve academic publishers two major problems overnight, inventory and cash flow. Under the system of failing almost since the days of Gutenberg, publishers always face the temptation of decreasing unit costs by printing more copies. And ever the optimists, Editors hoped against hope that their books would break out of the pack and become bestsellers against all odds because the 80-20 rule pertains as much to book publishing as to other forms of commerce. Persuading their marketing departments, which knew better, to go along with print runs that, as reality usually proved, would satisfy demand for the next 50 or 100 years instead of just the three years envisioned in the editor's projected budget. So, warehouses bulged with excess inventory. You're all familiar with those remainder sales, the special sales, and so forth, which locked up precious capital that otherwise could be used for publishing new books coming down the pipeline. In one fell swoop, digital printers offered salvation. Print runs could go as low as a single copy and still make economic sense. Lightning Source built its business originally on older backlist titles that publishers wanted to keep in print and wooed university presses uh, to send a lot of titles to them by absorbing the cost of digitization in many instances. Its alliance with Amazon.com expanded its scope uh, beyond just the retail bookstores that Ingram serviced and opened these older titles to a whole new audience, what came to be known as Wired editor Chris Anderson dubbed it the long tail. <laughs> 